Hello, my name is Dr. Peter Lekowski and I'm a sports specialist chiropractor. Today I'll be talking about the rotator cuff, focusing on three key areas. First, I want to show you some highlights of the relevant anatomy in this area. Second, I'll discuss the function of these muscles. Third, I'll provide some information about the source of rotator cuff tears. Shoulder pain and immobility are a common symptom. It is important to understand the anatomy of this area in order to properly treat patients. The shoulder joint proper, or the glenohumeral joint, is a ball and socket joint composed of the humeral head and a shallow glenoid fossa. The structure of this joint allows it to be the most mobile joint in the body, while simultaneously sacrificing stability. To keep the large head of the humerus stable within such a shallow socket, the rotator cuff muscles function to compress and hold the head of the humerus firmly within the glenoid fossa. The muscles that make up the rotator cuff are the supraspinatus, subscapularis, infraspinatus, and teres minor. Let's spend a minute on the supraspinatus. It's the most commonly affected muscle in the rotator cuff. The supraspinatus originates from the supraspinous fossa, it traverses laterally, inferior to the acromion, and inserts on the anterior facet of the greater tuberosity of the humerus. In addition to stabilizing the humeral head within the glenoid fossa, its other main function is to assist the deltoid muscle in abducting the arm. Let's review this function in the shoulder. I'm showing a muscle action animation of shoulder abduction. You can see here that there is more to abduction than simply the function of the supraspinatus and the deltoid muscles. Other muscles, such as the trapezius and the serratus anterior, play a very important role in stabilizing the shoulder blade for efficient and safe abduction of the shoulder complex. Trauma or microtrauma due to overload or that associated with poor movement strategies in the shoulder complex can result in injury to the rotator cuff. In some situations, the case is extreme and full thickness tears can occur. This type of tear can result from trauma, such as a fall or a hit to the shoulder. It can also result from progressive tendon attrition that we tend to see with old age. Thirdly, this can also be seen in individuals such as throwing athletes that expose their rotator cuff tendons to long durations of repetitive overload. Partially torn supraspinatus is frequently seen clinically. In general, rotator cuff tears usually occur in the tendinous portion of the muscle, close to the insertion point on the head of the humerus. In this pathology view, you can see partial tendon tearing of the supraspinatus. Symptoms of this injury include pain, decreased range of motion in the shoulder, and muscle weakness. So that brings us to the end of our discussion today. We talked about the rotator cuff anatomy, we talked about the function of the rotator cuff, and we reviewed rotator cuff tears. I used Visible Body's Muscle Premium to show you the anatomy and pathology of the rotator cuff. Thanks for watching.